Well, good morning, God's people. Uh, it's always a blessing to see <clears throat> God's people leading us in his praises and uh, just thank Adam for uh, obeying the Lord and leading us through that psalm. What a blessing it was to, to pray the scriptures. And I hope that that plays a role in your prayer life, that uh, we don't feel like we just have to come before God. I heard uh, Albert Moeller talk about this recently, and we don't need to feel like we just have to come before God and start just spewing out all of these things from our hearts or what's ever in our mind at that time, but that we have God's Word, and it is through God's Word that we are brought into His presence. And so praying the Scriptures is just one of the the best ways that we can pray. And I think it's, it's probably the best way that you can pray if you just feel uh, dry or, or spiritually distant from the Lord or just beat down in life like we've seen with the Israelites. Just open up God's Word, read a verse or two, read a phrase, read a word, talk to God about it, and watch Him work by means of His Holy Scriptures. Our passage for today is Exodus 7, 1 to 3. So if you will go ahead and go there in your Bibles. The sermon for last week was entitled, A Pause Before the Plagues. We are right around the corner from the beginning of the plagues. We're we're coming up on the first of the ten plagues. And last week we got this little pause in the narrative. Moses pauses the narrative to give us a genealogy, and so I hope that you enjoyed, uh, you were exuberant about your enjoyment of the genealogy uh, this past week, as you discussed in small group. I do hope that you were able to see how there are riches within these genealogies, and how we are, we, we learn our knowledge of God's will, our knowledge of God's story grows as we study these genealogies, and also our faith in Him. I can remember when we were uh, going through Genesis, those early genealogies uh, really impacted me. I, I had studied those before, and I ha- had known, you know, that these are this is the line to Christ. But getting into it in depth as we were going through Genesis is probably one of the most impactful times for me. Were those opening chapters of Genesis, where it just became so heavy and so clear to me that these that this genealogy was was leaning into Christ, that it was the lineage of Jesus, leaning up through Noah, up through Abraham, all the way down to David, and then down to the Christ. Well, that's not the genealogy that we got last week, but nonetheless, we see in Levi's genealogy uh, the importance of Moses and Aaron and the importance of the sacrificial system, God's plan for his people. As we saw, this genealogy, taken together with the verses that come immediately after it, tells us at least four things. So I just want to take a moment to summarize what we looked at last week as we saw this pause before the plagues, as we saw this genealogy. So four things. First, God has providentially preserved his people. At a time like this, in the midst of the circumstances that the Israelites are facing, enslaved and oppressed in Egypt, To even have a genealogy is in some ways a miracle. That these people have records, that they have heritage, that they are able to trace their various lines shows us that God is graciously preserving his people. He's preserving him through this great trial, this great tribulation. It just reminds us that God preserves us. He preserves us through all that we would endure in this life. He preserves us and he will bring us out through to the end. It also tells us this genealogy that Moses and Aaron have a legitimate lineage. For the readers of Exodus, they need to know who Moses and Aaron are. And not just what the narrative has told us so far, but they need to see in depth that Moses and Aaron are the Moses and Aaron who come from Israel through the line of Levi. And by the time that this would have been read, the sacrificial system would have been in place. And so we also saw that the genealogy gave us the high priestly line. And told us how the high priestly line can be traced back to Levi through Aaron, who was the first high priest. And finally, we saw that God uses imperfect instruments to accomplish his purposes. I think in 
many ways, this is probably the most encouraging aspect of our passage for last week, is it just tells us that, that God, of course, knows all the ways that we are fumbling along. And God is nonetheless faithful when we are faithless, that God is faithful and good and He uses us even though we are greatly imperfect. God is perfect. God's will is perfect. And His instruments in this world are all imperfect. And yet He uses us for His glory. I think that's really encouraging to the Christian, especially if you're here this morning and you feel useless. You feel as though God just can't use you or because of things that are from your past or just because of what's facing you in the present. And if it's sin, listen to the words of Jesus as he encounters people in the Gospels. He says, go and sin no more. Turn from sin today and trust that the Lord can use you. Though imperfect, he is mighty and able to accomplish his purposes through the likes of of Moses. And as we saw recently in, in our uh, children's ministry curriculum and our devotionals, he can use the likes of Samson. If he can use the likes of Samson, he can use any of us. Well, with that genealogical information in place, with the lineage of Moses and Aaron firmly established, the narrative moves on in chapter 7 to God's response to Moses. That's what we pick up with in chapter 7. As we enter into this chapter, God is responding to what Moses said back in chapter 6, verse 12. So if you already have your Bible open, go to chapter 6, verse 12. I'll read to you verses 11 and 12. Go in, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? Your very own people have refused to listen to the message that you've sent me to bring. How in the world is this Pharaoh going to listen? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Remember, Lord, I've already told you this. I can't speak well. This comment of Moses is highlighted again after the genealogy in verse 30. So we're not meant to understand that verse 30 is another instance of Moses saying that. We're simply brought back to verse 12 with verse 30. And so in verse 30, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? So that's where we're at as we enter into chapter 7. And it is God's response at the beginning of chapter 7 that leads us up to Moses and Aaron's next encounter with Pharaoh. Up to this point, we've only had one encounter with Pharaoh. And it went pretty bad from a human perspective. But now we are moving towards the second encounter with Pharaoh, which we'll look at today. And this encounter with Pharaoh comes right before the beginning of the plagues. And so next week we will start looking at the first plague. So the title for the sermon this morning is A Preparation for the Plagues. Last week was a pause before the plagues. We get a, we get a pause in the narrative with the genealogy. This week it is a preparation for the plague. So if you would go ahead and stand with me as we read God's Word together. going to read just our passage for today, Exodus 7, verses 1 to 13. This is the Word of God. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak. All that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great 
acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, or I am Yahweh, when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So I think this age of Moses and Aaron is kind of tying us back to what we read in the genealogy as we got the names of Levi and Kohath and and so forth. Or the years, the, the ages. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents." But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's pray and ask for God's help as we come to his word, that God would give us understanding in our minds, and that God would move us in our will. He would move us in our hearts to to obey him, to love him, to serve him, to die to self. You know, the third pillar of our mission statement is dying in community. And I know someone's just looking at um, the church online. That may seem a little bit weird, maybe, maybe sort of cultish, or maybe just it brings the idea at best of, you know, at the end of life when you're dying that you have people around you as you're dying. But that's not what it means. What it means is that we are intent on dying to self. We are intent, as we come together with God's people, we are intent on following the way of Christ, the way of the cross, in dying to ourselves. And so let's ask the Lord that he would use a passage like this to help us die to ourselves in community, that the Lord would spur us on in the Christian life and all the things that he commands us to do, and that by the power of the Spirit, we would be faithful to him, and that he would use his word even today to do that in our hearts. So let's ask that of him. Father, we thank you that we've gathered here this morning. It's a special time. We know that the angels are with us. They are looking in on this with great wonder. Lord, and we are so blessed to be together, to sing your praises, to pray, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to study your scriptures together, Lord, to to have the Word of God preached as it has been for thousands of years, Lord. You, you have given us the preached Word, and God, we praise You that we have it before us to read over and over again, to meditate upon and to understand. But we ask, Lord, that we would understand it with the purpose of doing it, that we would be obedient to You as we hear it, and Lord, that You would pierce our hearts just as You did those first Uh, Jews hearing the sermon of Peter, that gathering of 3,000 who uh, became Christians. Lord, we we think of of the work of the Spirit as he pierced their hearts. They were cut to the heart. Lord, would you do that work here in this place? Would you do that work in those who are watching from home, online, or wherever they are, Lord? Would you pierce and cut us to the heart? We pray that you would, uh, as you do that, that you would Fill those holes, those those pierced marks, Lord, that you would fill those wounds with your healing grace, that you would remind us of the glories of Christ. Father, that we would just be in awe of this great Christ, that we would see him in his many perfections, and that we would bow before him in humble adoration. Lord, that our bowing before Christ as King would also be accompanied by a deep, profoundly otherworldly trust 
in you, Lord, that we would trust in your great power, your great power to save, your great power to preserve. Lord, that we would trust in your great power to bring, as Adam prayed earlier, uh, us through the trials of life, Lord, others uh, uh, here this morning may be going through great fiery trials, Lord. The, the, some of us this morning may be going through the worst trials we have experienced in life, Lord, and we need to hear from you. So we pray, God, that you would mercifully give us your truth, that you, by your Spirit, would bring comfort and joy and peace in the gospel. But Lord, also that you would spur us on to do as you have called us to do, that we would be faithful, that we would be faithful to you. In the work of the kingdom. God, we, we look around at our world and we see such degradation, we see such wickedness, such abandonment of all sense of, of you, who you are and what you've called human beings to be and to do. And Lord, the currents of the world are mighty, but you are mightier. And so we know, God, that you can hold us fast in the midst of this godless culture, this godless generation. And so we pray that you would hold our church fast, that you would hold our leaders fast. And Lord, that you would help each of us to be courageous and faithful as we live out the Christian life. And Lord, that your word, even this morning, would be a means that you use to do that in each of us and among all of us as a church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So this passage that we have before us this morning, it prepares us for the plagues, as the title indicates, by giving us three things. So it's a preparation for the plagues, and it does that by giving us three things. So you can go ahead and put the points there up on the screen. First, the orienting summary. We get that in verses 1 to 5. And then in verses 6 to 10, the first part of verse 10, we get the obedient servants. And then in verses 10 to 13, we get the overpowering serpent. And so what we're meant to understand as we go through this is that the Lord, by means of Moses, is preparing the reader for the plagues which will come in the very next verse. We're being prepared for the contest and the rescue that is going to come as we go through the plagues, as God brings that final plague of killing the firstborn in all the houses of Egypt, God brings out his people with wealth to freedom, and then he brings them, of course, parts the sea, and brings them out to the mountain where he will give them his law. And so we are moving into all of that, and this is the passage that, if you will, if you're a golfer, I'm not, maybe once every two years or something, it's terrible, but if you are a golfer, this is teeing up everything that will follow and everything that we will see in the plague. So first, we have the orienting summary. And for that, let's look at verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. We need to remember that this is God's response to Moses' comment about his lips. I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? You have to go back to verse 12. You have to see that in verse 30. What we have here is God's response to Moses. He doesn't leave Moses without a word of reassurance, without a word of comfort, without a word of response. 
he gives Moses these words. And as we've seen from the beginning, Moses is insecure about his speaking abilities. Now, we're not told in Scripture why he is insecure about this. Uh, We're not told whether he has some form of a speech impediment or whether he's just sort of thinking that he's not very articulate or he's not very quick on his feet. It takes him a little while. Or maybe he says a lot of ums or whatever. Maybe it's, it's that basic. But it does seem to me that there is something that is holding down Moses' ability to speak. I think there is some evidence here for at least a minor impediment or disability on the part of Moses. At the burning bush in chapter 4 verse 10, he described himself as not eloquent and slow of speech and of tongue. So literally heavy, heavy of mouth and of tongue. It's the the image when, you know, uh, your mouth is light. You just go, 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 go. When it's heavy, it takes longer to go. And so that's the image that we have of Moses, at least as he understands himself, as he understands his own inabilities. His first encounter with Pharaoh resulted in a rejection and a more severe policy of oppression for the people. So when he went to uh, Pharaoh the first time, (coughs) Pharaoh gives him an emphatic no. Absolutely not. Who is the Lord that I should listen to him? No, no, and no was the answer that Pharaoh gave Moses. But that wasn't the end of it. Pharaoh didn't just say, now get out of my face. Pharaoh said, no, and because you have done this, essentially, because you all have so much time on your hands, now you're going to have to produce the same number of bricks without being provided straw. And so the result of Moses' first encounter with Pharaoh is... Pharaoh says no and cracks down on the people. And then, to make matters worse, this oppression resulted in a curse from the Israelite foreman. And so not only has has Pharaoh sent him away and cracked down on the people, but Moses and Aaron are waiting outside of the palace and the foremen come out after Pharaoh has basically told them, no, 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 it's going to be, you're going to produce the same number of bricks without being provided straw. After that, they run into Moses and this is what they say to him. the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink (coughs) in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in his in their hand to kill us may the Lord look on you and judge is a curse may God smite you Moses because you have done this to us you have done this Moses you are responsible You have put a sword in the hand of Pharaoh to kill us. That's the accusation that Moses gets from his people. Even more, even more. After he delivers to the people Yahweh's glorious personal message of promise and deliverance, as we read over there on the wall, one of our posters, this was their response. Chapter 6, verse 9. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So, so here's the point. If Moses thought that he was incapable of carrying out his mission at the burning bush, okay? This is in the first chapter. Not literally the first chapter of Exodus, but the first chapter of the story. If at that very early stage... Moses says that to God. If if he thought himself incapable of carrying out his mission before he ever got in front of the people, before he ever got in front of Pharaoh, he is certainly now, at this point, down in the dumps. Not only has Pharaoh rejected him and cracked down on the people, but the people have cursed him and they have rejected the subsequent follow-up, supposed to solve the problem message that the Lord gave, and they still will have none of Moses. They still will not listen. This has to be an extremely low point of confidence in Moses' life, 
in Moses' calling, in his vocation, in the work that the Lord has called him to do. The reason I've stacked it up there for you is because it, you maybe have forgotten some of those details. We need to see them stacked up. We need to see what from a human perspective is, is failure, 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 rejection, 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 rejection. That's what's on Moses' heart as these words, I am of uncircumcised lips, are on his tongue. And let me just say this to you. Maybe that's how you feel about your own vocation, your own work for the Lord. Maybe this is uh, reflective of uh, your situation, a low point down in the dumps when it comes to your service for the Lord. Maybe you're serving in children's ministry, and every time you go back there, you just feel like the kids, they're just not even listening to anything you're saying. Or maybe you're a parent, and you feel like you're pressing on with your kids, and you're trying to raise them in the Lord, but it's just you just keep falling on your face, you keep saying things, doing things that you didn't want to say, you didn't want to do, and then the things aren't going the way that you had planned that they would with your children. Or whatever area of vocation. Remember, this word vocation is a very big word. Moses has a very specific vocation, but each of us has many different vocations that the Lord has given us. Our biggest vocation is to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called in Christ. That is our greatest calling, and with under, underneath the banner of that calling are many little things, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, that the Lord has called us to. This work in which we can grow deeply discouraged. So what does the Lord do at this very low point in Moses' life, in Moses' vocation? Um, well, he, he speaks. He speaks. That's what God does. He speaks. That's what he's been doing from the very beginning. When he made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said, let there be light. God has been speaking, and things have been happening from the beginning. If you are in your vocation, feeling defeated or discouraged, there is no other place for you to retreat. There is no other fortress for your soul. There is no other hiding place than the word of the living God, where God speaks to his people. So, so stop sitting around, listening out for a word from God while your Bible just sits in a corner. Read the Bible. That's where God speaks. You're discouraged, you're frustrated, but you're not reading your Bible. What do you expect? What do you want? You want some sort of pagan sign? Some sort of collision of, of molecules, uh, atoms in your sphere of life that's going to be a eureka moment in which you're going to see the path forward? That's not how God works. That's paganism. That's new age spirituality. That's not Christian spirituality. Go to God's word. At the lowest point we've seen for Moses, God speaks. And by the way, it solves the problem, as we'll see in a moment. He gives his reassuring word to Moses. And this word of assurance comes with five parts. And what we find in these five parts is that it is basically a summary. And that's the reason for the point, the orienting summary. I'll talk about the orienting part in a little bit. But the summary part is... Basically, what God says to Moses is a summary. And this is really interesting because it tells us that it's not that we need new information from God. It's not that God's people need new information. I think that's another thing, too, is that we're looking for. Maybe, maybe you're the sign sighter, right, as I just described, and you're just sort of waiting for God to speak to you, and Bible's neglected, and that was, that was for you. But, but maybe... You're also the person that, that, that thinks, you know, you need to see some kind of new thing in the Bible, some sort of new bit of, of Christian doctrine, some sort of new bit of truth. And that may very well be the case, that you need to see it or see it more clearly. But what I want you to see here 
is that it's not that God's people need new information, it's that we need to be reminded of the truth that God has already revealed to us. If you've been a Christian and you've been in his word, you know the gospel. But we constantly need to be reminded of the gospel and all of the implications of the gospel, the fruit of the gospel, the glories of the gospel, the demands of the gospel and the comforts of the gospel. We need to be reminded. So it is not a bunch of new information that God brings to Moses at this point. It is a, a summary, but it's, it's a perfectly packaged summary that accomplishes Moses being reassured once and for all. So we see here six parts to this summary. You can write these words down. They're not going to be on the screen. You can write them down if you wish. But this is just an attempt to go through verses 1 to 5. What is this six-part summary that the Lord gives to Moses at this very low point in his life? And here they are. Mouthpiece, hardening, miracles, rescue, judgment, and renown. I'll go through each of those individually if you didn't get one. So first... Mouthpiece. Verses 1 to 2, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. Now this is essentially a repeat of what God told Moses back in chapter 4, verse 14. As I said, this is a summary So in chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, the Lord told Moses that Aaron, his brother, will be his mouthpiece. Aaron will act as Moses' voice. And this is really amazing because the Lord, he acquiesces to Moses on this front. Now, what's interesting is as we go on, we will see that Moses does a lot of the speaking. (laughs) Moses actually does the speaking throughout the narrative of the ten plagues. Aaron will do things with the staff and so forth, as we'll see. But Moses actually engages with Pharaoh. So Moses could do it all along. This is interesting. Moses could do it all along, but God still gives him Aaron to encourage him. God gives him Aaron to alleviate his fears. Do you see the, uh, the kindness of God? That even though Moses could have done it and would do it, God still makes provision for him in his weakness, in his fear, in his insecurity. This is the kindness of the Lord. Aaron will be Moses' voice to Pharaoh, as the Lord says here, if that is needed. So that's the first Part of this reassuring summary is mouthpiece. The second and third come together, hardening and miracles. Verses three to four. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Now, this is basically a repeat of what God told Moses back in chapter four, verse 21. When you go back to Egypt, See that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. So there's the miracles part. God has told Moses that he's going to perform lots of miracles, signs and miracles, wonders, all these different words for these displays of God's glorious power. It goes on, chapter 4, verse 21, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So we've already talked about this back in chapter 4, verse 21, where the Lord says, I'm going to do these miracles, but I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. God could have done one thing, and Pharaoh said, get out of here. I'm scared to death of Yahweh. But that's not what happened. God wanted to magnify his glory by multiplying his signs and miracles by means of hardening Pharaoh's heart so that he would refuse and God would magnify his glory. That's what's going on here with this hardening and these miracles. So Moses should not be surprised at Pharaoh's stubbornness. 
Moses should not be surprised when Pharaoh once again, and again, and again, and again, I'm not going to say it 10 times, but over and over again, Pharaoh's going to give a big, fat no. And Moses should not be surprised. Because Yahweh himself is behind this hardening. In other words, God is repeating this idea for Moses so that he will understand that when Pharaoh refuses, that does not mean failure. In fact, when Pharaoh refuses, that means that God's plan is moving along just as God intends it to. Everything is happening according to his plan. So first, mouthpiece. Second and third, hardening and miracles. Fourth and fifth, rescue and judgment. These are themes that we've already seen repeated throughout. But look at verse 4. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Now this is not merely rescue and judgment. I want you to see this. This is important. This is not just God saying, I'm going to rescue and I'm going to judge. This is not merely that. It is rescue through judgment. This is deliverance by means of judgment. Through judgment, God will rescue. By laying his hand on Egypt to punish it. By bringing great acts of judgment upon them for their sin against his people. By doing this, God will bring his people out of Slavery, rescue through judgment. And here we have a reminder of the cross, a pointer to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, it it shouldn't surprise us that there are many parallels between the Exodus and the cross because the Exodus in all of Scripture, apart from the cross, is the greatest display of the manifold attributes of God. It is the greatest display of God's character and God's glory. But there is a greater, and it is the cross. At the cross of Jesus, God magnifies who he is. He shows who Yahweh is more than in any other event in all of Scripture combined. The cross is the great act of God's glorification. And here, in this Rescue through judgment, we have a pointer to the cross. It is through judgment that God brings about our salvation. It is through putting our sins on Jesus. Remember, the cross is an awful place. And it is a wonderful place at the same time. The greatest evil that has ever occurred happened on Calvary. And the greatest blessing. The greatest gift that was ever given was at Calvary. God poured out his wrath on sin in the person of his son. Judgment took place at the cross. And that's the only reason that we won't be in hell. is because judgment took place at the cross. God poured out his wrath on Jesus that we can be forgiven that we can be redeemed. The cross is rescue through judgment. This is also a reminder that God's salvation will ultimately involve judgment. God will punish the wicked. He will throw Satan into the lake of fire as well as the wicked. Jesus will return to execute judgment and to rescue his people. And of course, this gives rise to all sorts of debates about the tribulation and the coming of Christ and a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, a post-tribulation rapture. How is it that the resurrection of the saints uh, will coincide with the judgment of the wicked? These are questions that many debate and discuss. And, but the point that I want you to see here is that both are parts of Christ's second coming. However, they are put together. Rescue through 
judgment. Jesus will return to execute judgment and to rescue his people. The bloodiest day in human history will be at the return of Christ. The bloodiest day of warfare, the most horrific day of killing. Know this, hear this, will be the coming of the warrior king, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he executes God's wrath on a sinful world. And yet, it will be the most glorious day of his visitation. When he will raise his saints to new life in their bodies and we will meet him in the air and forever we will be with the Lord. Rescue through judgment. Notice God's judgment here on those who have mistreated his people. These Egyptians have beaten, killed, murdered infants. They've enslaved. They've stolen, kidnapped from the people of God. He refers here to Israel as my people. God's people are his precious possession. And he will vindicate his people. This is why we can trust him with vengeance and not take it into our own hands. Think about that for a moment. What we're seeing here is God's vengeance on behalf of his people. God takes vengeance, so we do not have to. Romans 12, verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We don't have to get people back. God's going to take care of that. We don't have to make things right for ourselves. God is going to take care of all of that. Finally, we have renown. Verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh, when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. What is the ultimate reason for all that God does? This isn't just a Christian cliche. It's all throughout the Bible. The reason that God does what he does is for his own glory. We exist for his glory. And all that happens in the universe will ultimately result in his glory. And that's what we find here. God will magnify himself in the minds of the Egyptians. He will show that he alone is God. They will know that I am Yahweh. It says, Yahweh is God and there is no other. That's God's purpose. That's a big part of what God is doing. And we find later that this has an evangelistic purpose. In chapter 12, verse 38, when the people come out of Egypt, we read, a mixed multitude also went up with them. What does that mean? That means that some of these Egyptians have seen the glory and might of God. They've seen how in the plagues, God shielded his people in Goshen and he poured out his wrath on the Egyptians. They saw how the livestock of the Israelites were not touched. They've seen God's goodness and his might against sin, against his enemies. And they have said with Rahab and I think with Ruth, um, your God will be my God. I'm going with you. Not a descendant of Abraham, but I'm sticking with you guys. That's what we have in chapter 12, verse 38. The Egyptians will know, and some of them will even leave with the Israelites and become worshipers of the one true God. By magnifying himself over the gods of Egypt, he is bringing Egyptians into his people. And, of course, this anticipates the gospel going out to the Gentiles. As we see now, we are recipients of the gospel going out to the Gentiles, as we saw all throughout Romans. This is a little pointer to all of that. So what is the cumulative effect of this summary? And that's the reason for the first word. It orients Moses and Aaron towards moving forward with God's mission. It is as though up to this point Moses and Aaron are in the car 
you know, they're checking things. They've got it in drive. They go a little ways, but then they're looking to the left, looking to the right. There's lots of hesitancy. It is as though these words from God are meant to take Aaron's and Moses' faces and point them forward towards God's mission, put the car in drive, hit the gas, no more distractions, no more questions and complaints, moving forward. This summary orients Moses and Aaron to the mission of God. And that leads us to our second point, which we're going to go through a little more quickly, and that is the obedient servants. Look at verses 6 to 10, the beginning of, of verse 10. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Here I want to draw your attention to one big idea. Moses and Aaron are portrayed as Yahweh's obedient servants. We see this at the beginning, verse 6. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. And then we see it at the end in verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. The time has come to leave behind all hesitancy, all objections, questions, concerns, complaints, and to press on with God's commands. The time has come to stop looking to the left and looking to the right and to put the eyes forward and to do precisely what God has called them to do. Until this happens, there really can be no contest between Pharaoh and Yahweh. The Lord uses his human instruments And Moses and Aaron will be the means by which God does all that we just talked about. You know, we've already talked a lot about this notion of obedience in previous sermons. But for now, I want you to notice this one thing. We've talked about this, we've seen this in the last three sermons, this emphasis on obedience. But I want you to see this one thing at this point. We cannot expect to accomplish anything for the Lord without obeying Him. Period. Uh, exclamation point. We cannot expect to accomplish anything for the Lord without obeying Him. It is not about your gifts, your talents, and strengths. It's not about your resume, your education, your likability, your charisma, your passion, your enthusiasm, your ability to work well in teams, whatever. Fill in the blank. It's not about any of those things. It is about having an obedient heart before God, our master. It is about having an obedient heart before the Lord. That's what it's always been about since the beginning. That's what it was about with Cain and Abel. That's what it was about with Noah. That's what it was about with Abraham. That's what it has been about all along, a readiness to listen and to do as the Lord commands. God can give you what you need to do it. We're seeing that with Moses. Moses and Aaron are told to go to Pharaoh, and they do so. Moses is told that Pharaoh will demand a miraculous sign, and when he does, Moses is to tell Aaron to cast his staff to the ground to become a serpent, and that's exactly what They do. They are obedient. At this point, God's servants have been thoroughly prepared for the contest that will follow. Through what God has said to them, through what God has repeated to them, they have become at this point, before the plagues, fortified in doing precisely what God has commanded them to do. Come what may. Come what may. They are ready to stand before Pharaoh. Now they are ready for the plagues, to be instruments of God's might in Egypt. As we finish up this morning, we come to the overpowering serpent, verses 10 to 13. Look with me there. 
So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Let me just say a quick word about this. The word here is different from the word for serpent back at the very beginning, at the burning bush. It's different from the word that we see, for example, in Genesis 3. It's a different Hebrew word for serpent. And in fact, this has led some to think that this is some sort of dragon or crocodile because the word, the Hebrew word here, is the word used sometimes for serpent, but other times for sea monsters or dragons, these, these, these incredibly uh, huge creatures, powerful creatures. So some have argued here that there's something like a large crocodile or something that the staff turns into. But what we'll find as we go a little further in verse 15 Moses will use the other word for serpent that clearly means serpent for this event. And so that tells us that Moses is using these two words both for serpent. So I don't think we need to find anything here other than a serpent. So it became a serpent, maybe a very large king cobra, maybe a beyond normal large cobra. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, And they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. This is probably one of the most well-known scenes from the Exodus. It marks the beginning of the contest. The first of the miraculous signs that God will show to Egypt. But in contrast to some interpreters, I don't think we we can really regard this as one of the plagues. So some people want to see this as the first plague and then the turning of the Nile into blood as the second plague. But this does not seem to be one of the plagues. Rather, it is a prelude or an introduction to the plagues. It is teeing up what is about to happen. It anticipates what will follow. It is a way of communicating the significance of the miracles and judgments to come. Unlike the plagues, this does not cause destruction in Egypt. It is not a judgment on Egypt. We're meant to understand all of the plagues as God's judgment, his great acts of judgment on Egypt. Well, this is hardly an act of judgment in in the kind of way that we see with the plagues. Moreover, it is requested by Pharaoh. Pharaoh wants this sign. He doesn't ask for any of the other plagues, but he wants to see this sign to validate Moses and Aaron. So what happens? Well, the story is pretty straightforward and briefly told. Aaron cast down his staff, presumably the same staff that Moses had at the burning bush, and it becomes a serpent. Remember, Back at the burning bush, when the Lord had given Moses this sign, it was meant to be for the people of Israel. So Moses said, uh, what if they won't listen to me? And God gave him a series of signs. Remember, the second sign was he put his hand in his cloak, and it came out. It was white. It had some kind of skin disease on it. And then he put it back and pulled it back out, and it was clean. It was okay. Well, the first one, the one before that, was the serpent. God tells Moses to throw down his staff. And of course, Moses, it turns into a serpent. Moses runs away. He's scared. And then God says, pick it up by the tail. And Moses, we see Moses' obedient heart in part at that early stage where he actually does it. He picks up this snake by the tail. And immediately when he picks it up, it becomes a staff. Well, God told Moses that this sign would be for the Israelites. That when he came to speak with the elders of the people, he would do this sign and they would Believe Well, of course, he did do that sign before the Israelites with Aaron, and they did believe. But here, this sign is being used as a sign for Pharaoh. So what is Pharaoh's response to all of this? Well, he calls the wise men and the sorcerers of his people. He's got confidence in his wise men and sorcerers. We see this with, with remember, Pharaoh's dream back in Genesis Uh, when Pharaoh had a dream and he ended up bringing Joseph forward. But before that, he calls all of his magicians, wise men, sorcerers of Egypt, calls them forward to interpret his dream. Well, that's what Pharaoh does. He calls these men to come and see if they can 
do a standoff with Moses and Aaron. See if they can do something cooler than what Moses and Aaron did with their staff. This word sorcery points to occultist practices that played such a big role in Egyptian religion. If you study Egyptian religion, what you will see is that this sort of sorcery and magic was laced throughout all of Egyptian religion. This occultist dark magic, these practices that were, I think we are to understand, demonic. Now, some have argued when the sorcerers are able to replicate exactly what Aaron and Moses did with the staff. Some have argued that the, these are demonic powers. And others have argued that they're doing some sort of trick. This is just a, like a magician's trick. So they're trained. Some have even said that they actually came to the battle, so to speak, with cobras that had been put in some sort of hypnotic state of paralysis where they've become rigid like a staff and they're holding them like staffs and then when they throw them to the ground that it actually you know breaks out of its hypnosis and starts squirming around on the ground as a snake because it was a snake to begin with. I am inclined to think that this is simply Satan's power at work in the world. I am inclined to not see this as the trick sleight of hand of a magician, but rather the work of demons who governed all of Egypt's religion, who governed all of the sorcery and evil practices that went along with Egypt's religion. And I would interpret similar things in Greece, for example, with the Oracle of Delphi and other things. Demonic powers involved in these displays. We know that there are evil supernatural powers in the world at work. We know this is the case. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus says that there will be false teachers who do not know the Lord. People who would say to the Lord, and in this case, maybe not even say this to the Lord, but in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about those who will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these miraculous things in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. That was not me working through you. Satan is real. Demons are real. And how they manifest their power in the world is mysterious to us. They're much that we just do not know. But I think what we are to understand here is the work of evil through the sorcery of these Egyptian magicians. I think we're also meant to understand this because of how many times we are told in the law that God's people are not to participate in divination or sorcery or any kind of necromancy, calling up of the dead. All of this stuff is viewed from the perspective of the Lord and in the law as utterly evil, as utterly wicked. And so I think we are to understand that it is a reality in the world. So they do it, patting themselves on the back. The other serpents... There are more numerous than Aaron and Moses' serpent. Uh-oh, Moses and Aaron have one serpent, one staff changed into a serpent. These sorcerers have multiple staffs that have been changed into serpents. And you can just imagine what's going to happen next, and the answer is simple. Aaron's staff devours all the other serpents, however many there were, eats them up. Multiple serpents against one, and the many are devoured by the one. Now, you could say that this is a picture of the plagues in short. This is one little picture of all that's going to happen through the ten plagues. Yahweh's superiority over Pharaoh. Yahweh's superiority over Egypt. Over the magical powers of Egypt's religion. This is a prelude of what will become so abundantly obvious through the ten plagues as God establishes his preeminence 
over all that Egypt can bring as these serpents are devoured by the one. So what is Pharaoh's final response? Verse 13, still, still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So who's in control? Yahweh. God is in control. And although from a human perspective, it seemed like Moses and Aaron were failing, God's plan was moving forward. And that's what we will see as God shows his glory through the ten plagues and beyond. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for instructing our minds and for moving and working in our hearts. Father, we thank you that you have given us this revelation of yourself from the very first word of Genesis to the very last word of Revelation. You have given us this to reassure us, to comfort us, to remind us, to spur us on, to teach us, to show us what it means to know Jesus and to cling to him. Father, would we be committed to your word and we thank you for showing your glory in Egypt. We thank you for showing your glory throughout history and uh, preeminently at the cross. We thank you for showing your glory in each of our conversions. Lord, we thank you for the glory of your providence as you watch over us, take care of us. Lord, as you see us through the trials of life, the challenges to our faith, the temptations to sin, as you see us through all of these things as a good shepherd, you will lead us home. We thank you, God, for these glorious truths. We pray that they would settle in our hearts and that we would be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. We pray that you would minister to us as we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we would be just moved greatly by uh, the, the reality of the gospel, that the death and resurrection of Christ would become clearer to us, that this remembrance time, as we see there with Moses, that we would remember as you summarize the gospel through the Lord's Supper, as you give us this little snapshot of what Christ did, Lord, we pray that we would be reminded and that through that being reminded that we would be spurred on to live for you this week. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.